Good afternoon, everybody. All right. Ambassador Ko, students and faculty of the LKY School of Public Policy, members of the press, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As the United States Ambassador to Singapore, I'm honored to kick off the second in our new U.S. Embassy LKY School Speaker Series by introducing tonight's speaker and moderator. It's a testament to the number of high-level American officials that come to Singapore that we have inaugurated this speaking series. I believe it's important that we showcase every official that comes to Southeast Asia. It is another way that we remind people in this region that the rebalance is real, that America has always been here and always will be. And 2016 is a great year to do this, as we mark the 50th anniversary of formal diplomatic relations between the United States and Singapore. Although, although this relationship goes back 180 years at least and encompasses every dimension, from culture, the environment, to security and investment. In fact, it's fitting that tonight's speaker and moderator share the stage tonight, embody many elements of that relationship, and so it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, America's top Asia diplomat, Assistant Secretary for East Asia Pacific, Daniel Russell. Danny is a senior career State Department official, previously serving as the White House National Security Council's senior advisor for Asian affairs to the president, and in many other positions across Asia and Europe, including several tours in Japan. However, one secret that some might not know about Danny is today marks from seven years ago today, he walked into the White House on President Obama's first day in office and has been by his side in different capacities since that time. Ambassador Tommy Ko needs no introduction for this audience. He's been there almost every step of the way over the last 50 years as the relationship between the United States and Singapore has broadened and deepened. He's a strong ally and the kind of friend who's unafraid to tell you what he's thinking, even if you don't want to hear it. With that, <laughs> he said that's Kishore, not him, but I, oh, I, I, there's enough candor in Singapore to go around, Tim, Tom, Tommy. With that, let's welcome Danny onto the stage for his wide-ranging remarks on the United States, Singapore, and the region. Thank you, Danny, for being with us. Perfect. Hello, everybody. It's good to be back in Singapore. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Wager. We're really, really proud of you and the terrific job that you do and that our team here uh, in Embassy Singapore does representing the United States. It's a pleasure for me to be here at the Lee Kuan Yew School. Uh, I've had the honor of meeting with uh, former minister mentor Lee Kuan Yew when he visited Washington when he came to the White House. And uh, I know firsthand that uh, from President Obama on down, um, he's really deeply and sorely missed. Uh, it's a particular honor for me to be here today with Ambassador Tommy Ko. Uh, he's a living legend. He was an extraordinarily effective ambassador to the United States when I first entered the uh, U.S. Foreign Service. He was equally legendary as a permanent representative to the U.N. when I was assigned to the U.S. mission uh, to the U.N. there with uh, Ambassador Tom Pickering. And his historic accomplishments as president of the Law of the Sea Conference uh, really are critical to stability and prosperity throughout the world, uh, not only, but importantly, in the South China Sea. And the free trade agreement that he negotiated with the US, uh, the first and arguably the most successful free trade agreement we have with ASEAN, helped pave the way for the TPP agreement uh, that will be signed uh, in just a matter of a few weeks. So I came to Singapore, uh, came back to Singapore today for our regular strategic partnership dialogue, which I just held uh, at the Foreign Ministry with uh, Permanent Secretary Chi Wee Kyung, my counterpart. These are meetings that allow me to get, uh, to get advice and to consult with my counterparts here. And frankly, good advice is one of uh, Singapore's main exports. Uh, when Singapore talks, world powers listen. 
So in the conference that we had today, uh, we had a chance to review the progress that we've made, the challenges we faced, and to try to chart a way forward together. Uh, and 2016, which as Ambassador Wager uh, mentioned, marks the 50th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the US and Singapore, uh, we have in front of us a very important year. But let me start by offering a little background and a little context, starting when I returned to Washington in 2008, uh, almost uh, a decade after I left to serve overseas. At that time, the US and the world was facing a very serious financial crisis. At that time, the lion's share of America's attention and resources were focused heavily in the Middle East. And many people, both in the US and here, felt that we weren't paying Asia enough attention. So in January of uh, 2009, as Ambassador Wager said, almost seven years to the day, uh, I was assigned by the State Department to work at the National Security Council for President Obama as a member of his Asia team. And he made very, very clear to all of us from the outset that uh, he believed that America's economic interests, that our national security, and that our values required that we allocate the time and attention, uh, that we rebalance our resources to ensure that we were fully engaged in the affairs of the Asia Pacific region. And it's worth unpacking why he placed so much importance on the region. Let me give you four reasons. First, there's the simple economics of shared prosperity. We recognized that the world's economic center of gravity had been shifting to the Asia Pacific. We expected that that would continue, and it has. We recognize that the United States and the Asia Pacific region must grow together. We, the US, have served as the region's engine of economic growth, uh, as the ultimate consumer, for example, of most exports leaving Asia, as the source of most of Southeast Asia's foreign direct investment, uh, and as the font of innovation that keeps all of our economies moving ahead. At the same time, we, the US, rely heavily on the region. It's not just a workshop for the world. It's not just a growing consumer of American products, uh, but the region is increasingly a co-innovator, a partner in developing new solutions to big problems that we all face. These economic links show that we can't afford not to be in the region. Second, there's the pressing necessity of shared security. 2009, like 2016, unfortunately, were marked by nuclear tests by North Korea, a dangerous reminder of the DPRK's dogged pursuit of a nuclear-armed missile capability. And other challenges further underscored the importance of our presence and security partnerships in the region. Third, there's the long-term importance of institution building. President Obama's rationale was straightforward. Strong institutions promote a rules-based order, which in turn serves as a break on the strong and creates space for the small. That argued, that objective, argued for us showing up. Uh, it argued for active participation in the affairs of the region. And fourth, there's the moral imperative to be true to the universal values of human rights and freedom. In the US, we just celebrated Martin Luther King's uh, birthday. <clears throat> and as he famously said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So we've used our influence to support those worldwide and in the region who promote justice, who promote good governance and opportunity. 
But let me speak briefly about what we've done in each of these four areas over the past seven years. We've taken our role as an economic power and as a model of openness very seriously. We responded to the global economic downturn, not with protectionism, but by upgrading and completing the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement and doubling down on opening up trade and investment through the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We remain the largest investor in Singapore and Southeast Asia, well ahead of others, including ahead of China, ahead of Japan, ahead of, ahead of South Korea combined. We pursued initiatives to expand our trade with China, including through negotiations on a bilateral investment treaty. We championed the Global Information Technology Agreement, which will be particularly beneficial to innovation centers like the US and like Singapore. And those who predicted America's decline, who bet against us, have lost their bet. They overlooked the extraordinary resilience of America's economy, uh, an environment that fosters innovation, that a spirit of entrepreneurship, a diverse and uh, young workforce, a resurgent manufacturing sector, powered by our growing supplies of clean energy and new energy. All of this will be augmented by the entry into force of the TPP and by the formation of the ASEAN Economic Community, which in turn is poised to accelerate reform, promote integration and convergence with Singapore as an important hub. Next, we've taken our role as a military power and a guarantor of security and peace very seriously. We're working more closely than ever before with allies and security partners to keep that peace. Our strategy includes stationing 60% of our Navy in the region, including the rotational deployment of the uh, littoral combat ships, cutting edge technology, um, right here at Changi Naval Base. And the strategy extends to our commitment to our allies, including through enhanced defense cooperation agreements that give US forces the access uh, that we need to deal with crises or humanitarian disasters, uh, but also through training and through capacity building. And our strategy also includes newer partners like Vietnam, new programs with older partners like our rotational force program with Australia, and a range of uh, multilateral exercises like the one uh, Cobra Gold that's uh, being hosted in uh, Thailand again uh, this year. So I think that the reason we are the region's preferred security partner, the reason that we are invited in and invited back, is not merely because of the quality of the American military. I think it's because we're trusted. And I think that we're trusted because as strong as we are, the United States accepts that the same rules apply to us as apply to you. We support the rule of law even when it's not convenient. And that brings me to the third priority that I mentioned, which is building up institutions. We've done this through the US ASEAN Strategic Partnership, the President's annual participation in the East Asia Summit and the US ASEAN Leaders Meeting. And by joining the ASEAN Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, the TAC, and by sending a permanent ambassador to uh, the ASEAN headquarters in, in Jakarta. These are the diplomatic foundations of long-term security. These are the ways that we've institutionalized the rebalance. This is how we've set the new normal of our foreign policy. And now American active participation has become the new normal for ASEAN. The US now is closer than ever before with ASEAN as an organization and with almost all of its member states. We're aligned on issues like climate change and counterterrorism. We're working with 
some of the region's least developed economies and were rallying donors to address health and food security, education, employment for millions who live in the Mekong River Basin. We're working together on disaster preparedness and we've led the international response to disasters like Typhoon Haiyan. And more ASEAN students are studying in the United States than ever before. I hope some of you will join them. And we have a program, uh, the Waisili program, Young Southeast Asia Leaders Initiative, now 50,000 strong, which has linked dynamic, young, motivated people throughout ASEAN to the United States. And because it's an ASEAN-wide program, to an extraordinary extent, has linked them to one another. So we want to expand our partnership with uh, young leaders, and I encourage uh, the students in the group to join YCLE if you haven't already. Programs like this one show that we're investing in our relationships for the long term. Our commitment to ASEAN centrality and fostering rule-setting institutions demonstrates we want to work with the region, not dominate it. We are a collaborative partner, not a hegemonic one. We want trust, not tribute. We want friends, not vassal states. So a region where major powers partner with ASEAN will be a stable region. A region where major powers seek spheres of influence won't be. I believe that because we've strengthened relationships and built trust, we've been able to advance a values-based foreign policy. But I want to be clear, I'm not talking about American values. I'm not talking about Western values. These are universal values. And nowhere has President Obama's commitment to extend a hand to those who will work for human dignity been more apparent than in our support for the important reforms in, in Burma, in Myanmar. The historic elections in November allowed the Burmese people to freely choose their leader, and they did, with a vengeance. The, after five years of opening and reform, driven from within, but with help from all of us, we've set us the stage, they've set the stage for free and fair elections. They set the stage for Myanmar to emerge from five decades of repression and military rule. Set the stage for Burmese citizens to build unity, dignity, opportunity, prosperity set the stage for a stronger ASEAN. And we've been proud to support this transformation and will continue to do so as Myanmar, under Aung San Suu Kyi's leadership, addresses the very significant challenges uh, ahead. Now, of course, Singapore held elections last year, and barely a week ago, the people of Taiwan also showed the world again what a mature, Chinese-speaking democracy looks like. But values-based diplomacy isn't only about good news. It's not only about elections. That's why we speak out and work for basic rights and freedoms throughout the region. That's why we won't be silent when human rights are violated, when elected governments are overthrown, when peaceful protesters and activists are incarcerated, when politicians and lawyers are intimidated, when bloggers are silenced, when publishers are, and reporters are attacked or are disappeared. We strive for a moral foreign policy, not a moralistic one. And that's why we contribute to health and nutrition programs in Laos to girls' education in Cambodia, to food and water security along the Mekong, to disaster relief and recovery in the Philippines, to climate adaptation throughout the Pacific, and to combating trafficking and 
uh, dealing with humanitarian and refugee crises, especially uh, those in the last year that have cost so many lives. I was in the room this past November when President Obama met with refugees and met with trafficking victims that Malaysia is genuine, generously caring for. And we too are dedicated to helping those in need. I was struck, I thought President Obama's actions showed that uh, these migrants are not people to be pitied, they're people to be helped. Uh, they're not just people who need assistance, they're people who are fully capable of developing the skills and the abilities to go with their hopes and dreams, people who would be a credit to any country. So my point more broadly is this, that diplomatically, militarily, institutionally, and morally, the United States is invested in Southeast Asia. We're fully present and accounted for, both now and for the long term, because in the Pacific century, our futures are bound together. So let's take a quick look at this year, 2016. It's an election year in the United States, so before you ask, let me just tell you who's gonna win. <laughs> just kidding. But what I can assure you with real confidence is this, that regardless of who wins the election, America's attention to the Asia Pacific region will endure. And I'll tell you why. Simply put, it's in our own interest as I've explained. Moreover, the contours of our Asia policy simply aren't contentious at home. They're truly bipartisan. Sure, you see tactical differences over how to deal with North Korea's nuclear program or with China's assertiveness in the South China Sea, but there's no serious policy player in Washington who thinks that we should pull back from the Asia Pacific region, nobody. So now that I've established we're not going away, uh, what are some of the big challenges that we face for the rest of 2016? Well, as I said before, North Korea's latest nuclear test highlights the existential threat of nuclear weapons. And terrorism in Jakarta reminds us that since anyone can be attacked, all of us must act. And the tensions in the South China Sea show that while decades of open trade and rules-based cooperation have lifted hundreds of millions out of poverty in Asia, coercive behavior can put stability at risk. So let's just take those one at a time. On North Korea, we and our partners have a strategy of deterrence, of pressure, and of diplomacy. To maintain deterrence, we're modernizing our security alliances with South Korea and Japan. To keep up pressure, we're enacting stronger sanctions, including at the UN. We're mobilizing the international community to obstruct North Korea's proliferation activities and to confront its human rights abuses. And the protests out of Pyongyang show that this is hitting home. But this pressure isn't to punish North Korea. It's designed to show North Korea's leadership that the world will never accept them as a nuclear weapons state or provide economic assistance in the absence of denuclearization. To get them to accept that they have no viable alternative to a negotiated end to their nuclear and their missile programs. We have extended a hand but Pyongyang, so far, will not unclench its fist. And Mr. Kim need no look, look no further than the Iran deal to show we keep our word. A better path is open to North Korea if it will honor its commitments, negotiate denuclearization, and comply with international law. Now, we're also uniting around a strategy to contend with terrorism. A counter-ISIL coalition with support from Singapore and Malaysia and others across Asia 
is working to stop the flow of recruits and funds to the battlefields of Syria and Iraq. And as more and more territory is taken back from ISIL, in Iraq, programs to stabilize these areas with basic services and attract returning displaced families are receiving strong financial support from countries like Japan and the ROK. But the recent attack in Jakarta shows it's not enough to defeat ISIL on the battlefield. We must prevent ISIL from recruiting, radicalizing, and inspiring others in the first place. So across Southeast Asia, governments are responding to this challenge. Singapore, for example, is partnering with civil society to address radicalization and recruitment. Malaysia is establishing a counter-messaging center to push back on the insidious ISIL propaganda. And working together across agencies, across borders, that's essential to this effort. That's why we've offered to support governments in the region as they work to strengthen information sharing, uh, border security, law enforcement cooperation, as they respond to the threat of returning foreign fighters. And moving to the South China Sea, instead of restraint and the respect for neighbors and peace that both China and ASEAN promised in the 2002 Declaration of Conduct, we've seen a massive campaign of reclamation and construction of large military-grade runways and facilities on disputed reefs in the Spratleys. And despite the protests, despite the best efforts of many, many countries, Continued efforts to operationalize runways are exacerbating tensions as we speak. We all see reports on a regular basis of ships and planes being warned away and fishermen being chased out of their traditional fishing grounds. You can't claim to uphold freedom of navigation and then block access to international waters by calling it a quote, military security zone or concepts that just don't exist in international law. We've consistently called on all parties, not only just China, to reduce tensions in the South China Sea. We've called on all claimants to clarify their claims consistent with international law. And we've called on all parties to use diplomatic or legal mechanisms, not coercion to, to reconcile disputes. But the pace of unilateral actions to change the status quo is actually increasing. And that undermines regional stability, as the statements by ASEAN leaders and foreign ministers have made clear. Now, neither Singapore nor the United States have any territorial ambitions in the South China Sea. Both of us value our relations with all of those who have claims themselves. We're not backing one claimant against another or saying their claim is better than theirs. We are, however, backing international law. We're backing the peaceful resolution of disputes. We're backing the principle of freedom of navigation and overflight. The U.S. and Singapore, one of the world's biggest countries, one of the world's smallest countries, we both agree that the issue here in the South China Sea isn't about the rocks. It's about the rules. So in a few months, when the Law of the Sea Tribunal hands down its decision on the pending case over the nine dash line and other matters, the outcome, whatever it is, will be binding on both China and the Philippines, the two, two signatories to the convention, regardless of whatever the decision might ultimately be. But even if the decision by the tribunal were to favor the Philippines, 
It will not undermine China's right to claim sovereignty to recognize land features and their territorial waters. So the case under UNCLOS really is about rules and not about the rocks. And I think that what we are seeing is that peaceful cooperation based on respect for international law becomes even more important to all of us as global economic integration becomes tighter. But it's not only international law that matters in the 21st century. In a growing number of countries around the world, civil society and human rights, civil rights, are under increased pressure, under threat. It's a vibrant civil society that enables the free exchange of ideas on independent media and the ability to speak up and to challenge orthodoxy. These are all keys to success, including and especially economic success in the 21st century. Corruption can't be rooted out if justice isn't independent of politics. Even if in corrupt individuals can be purged, corruption won't be. And a knowledge economy can't grow where information, which is the lifeblood of progress, is manipulated or is blocked. So all of these issues and challenges are on the agenda for 2016 in virtually all of the engagements that we have. Secretary Kerry and Defense Secretary Carter met in Washington and discussed these, all of these issues last week in Washington in their 2 plus 2 meeting with the Philippine foreign and uh, defense secretaries. President Obama discussed all of these issues just the day before yesterday in, in Washington in the Oval Office with Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, your foreign ministry's perm rep, Chiwi Kyung, and I discussed these issues today in our strategic dialogue. Tomorrow, I'm flying to Vientiane, to Laos, to uh, connect with Secretary Kerry, to consult uh, with the Lao as ASEAN chair. From there, we'll go on to Phnom Penh. From there, we'll go on to Beijing. These issues are what we need to talk about. Just a few weeks later, uh, Secretary Kerry and I will join President Obama at the Sunnylands estate in uh, California, near Palm Springs, where he'll host Prime Minister Lee and the other nine ASEAN leaders for a historic summit that reflects America's enduring interest in this Southeast Asia. And we have a packed US ASEAN agenda, as well as a packed calendar uh, for engagement with the Asia Pacific region in 2016. The leaders at Sunnylands will talk about how we can support integration in the new ASEAN economic community. They'll talk about trade and investment and how we can work together to promote innovation and promote entrepreneurship. These are areas that create opportunity and prosperity for millions, for tens of millions of people. They'll talk about climate change, which directly affects the security and the welfare of our citizens. They'll work to expand maritime cooperation, which is vital to the region's economy and to food security. They'll seek uh, ways to promote information sharing to help stop foreign terrorist fighters and transnational criminals. Uh, and they'll talk about how we can take our dynamic programs to engage uh, young leaders and to engage women across society to the next level. And just as important as the agenda at the Sunnyland Summit is the maturity that it shows in our relationship. That our leaders can gather in a less formal atmosphere and actually have an open exchange of ideas instead of just a ritualistic exchange of uh, talking points. And that speaks to the leaders' trust for one another. It serves as a building block for enduring friendship. And after Sunnylands, 
President Obama in late March will host uh, a, a nuclear security summit in Washington that many Asian leaders will attend. He'll then travel to Japan in May for the G7 summit. Secretary Kerry and our Treasury Secretary will co-chair the strategic and economic dialogue again with China this summer, this time in Beijing. And President Obama himself in the early fall will visit Laos for the ASEAN leaders meeting and the uh, East Asia summit and then Beijing for the G20. Secretary Kerry uh, in the same time frame will host a conference on oceans again in Washington. Uh, and while they're at home, both the President and the Secretary will be rallying support in Congress for the TPP and for continued funding of our Asia priorities. So as you can see, there's a tremendous investment continuing by the United States in our uh, Asia-Pacific relations. Uh, there's a very high tempo. And if you take a step back, perhaps what's most remarkable about that tempo, that high pace of engagement is simply the fact that it's not seen as remarkable at all. This high pace of engagement that I've just described to you in 2016 now seems normal, our new normal, and ASEAN is very much at the center of it. The strong bipartisan support for a policy that's rooted in what's best for America is what gives me confidence and should give you confidence that any future administration is going to carry on with the rebalance. The policy is a proven winner. The administration has implemented it and expanded it despite ISIL, despite Iran, despite Ukraine, despite Syria. And I think ultimately that's probably the most persuasive argument that the policy is uh, to be sustained. We in America recognize that the Pacific century is underway, and we look forward to continuing to work hand in glove with Singapore to shape it. So I'll stop there and invite uh, Ambassador Co-op. Thank you very much. <laughs>